Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento, and this is one of my lectures on expected value theory for my Philosophy 61 inductive logic class. Specifically, this lecture is based on um, our uh, book in Hacking's Introduction to Probability and Inductive Logic, and we're specifically looking at Chapter 8 this week. So we're going to do expected value theory, and in order to do expected value theory, we've got to talk about utility. Um, when we make real-life decisions in the face of uncertainty, that requires us not only to identify the probabilities of the various outcomes, but also to evaluate the value of these outcomes. And expected value theory gives us a way to uh, quantify and weight and average decisions so we can figure out what decisions are better than what decisions. So it's a way to sort of be rational in our decision-making. You know, you've got these complicated choices, like you can take an interesting job for $35,000 a year, or you can take a boring job for $70,000 a year, and um, you put different values on the, the interesting part, on the dollar part. Uh, so one of the most basic components of expected value theory is this notion of utility. Uh, utility is just a term we're going to use, and it sounds... Um, it has a negative connotation to it in some ways, but all it means in this context is that uh, the utility of something is just the value we get from it. Different people get different values from different things. That's fine. Um, we just, uh, in, in, within decision theory, the way we describe that is we say that there's a utility, utility function that comes from it. Uh, the units in which this value can be expressed can vary depending on what kind of context we've got. Dollars are very typically the way we do that, so it's very easy for us to all to understand how dollars represent value. Um, although dollars are not the same as value, they represent it, and that's just a way that we've agreed to, to uh, quantify it or to deal with it. Um, so let's start talking about how expected value theory works and try to understand it. I'm going to give a justification in English for it, and ultimately we're going to end up with a with a math theorem here that lets us do the decision. So when you make decisions in the real world, your actions never have certain outcomes. You're always uh, making guess guesses. You're making estimates about what's going to happen. There's a range of things that could happen, and there's probabilities that we on the front side we attach to each one of those things, and we attach different values to those outcomes. So how should we understand that? I mean, take a really simple case. Imagine I'm considering whether or not to park illegally for 10 minutes in front of a Starbucks while I run inside for coffee. So I'm either going to get a ticket or I won't get a ticket. Those are the two possible outcomes in this case. We'll just treat two mutually exclusive outcomes now. If I do get a ticket, then let's say that's a $50 ticket, a $50 fine. And if I don't get a ticket, then I saved a little bit of time um, and I... Uh, um, you know, in the other case where I decided to pay the meter, I paid $1.50 on the meter. All right, so suppose there's a 1% probability that I'll get a ticket. That means that if I were to run this decision over and over again, then in 1% of the cases, I'd get a ticket, and in 99% of the cases, I wouldn't. If they were enforcing the ticket, enforcing the parking meters more often than that, you know, at a 10% or 20% rate, then you'd expect that to, to, to pan out in my making this decision over and over again. So when we start thinking about the broad cases and we start looking at big numbers, we imagine, okay, so imagine I was to make this single decision into a policy, and what would that do um, big picture. What would that cost me? What would that benefit me? Um, start aggregating decisions in the way that uh, Kahneman also suggests we do. All right, so if I average those losses over all the times that I did this, that is, um, suppose I park illegally, you know, hundreds or thousands of times over the years. So in a single case, I'd incur a loss of 1% of, uh, of $50 or 50 cents. That is, each decision to not pay the meter would cost me 50 cents. Now, where am I getting that 50 cents number? Well, we've said that in this case that the um, you're only going to get a ticket 1% of the time. And if a, a ticket costs you $50, then suppose I was to do it 100 times and I got ticketed exactly once. That's a $50 ticket for 100 times I did it. And if you average all those, that means I paid 50, in effect, I paid 50 cents a piece. So aggregated run, you know, running the weighted average here, the weighted average cost for each one of these single choices is 50 cents, even though most of the time I wouldn't get a ticket, and on rare occasions I would get a ticket for $50. Okay, but the decision to pay the meter only cost me, let's suppose in this case, $1.50. 
So it would be cheaper in this case, if I was thinking about aggregating my decisions and averaging, to not pay the meter rather than to pay it. So in this particular instance, not paying is going to cost me 50 cents on average per time I do it, whereas paying costs me $1.50 each time I do it. So it looks like if we're just sort of trying to maximize utility and just trying to um, uh, optimize the dollars in my pocket, then the rational thing to do, the best thing to do is to cheat the meter in this kind of case. Um, all right, so the general principle behind expected value theory comes actually from Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. And the idea is that we, we always ought to act so that you maximize utility. So if utility is the stuff that I value, and in this case that happens to be money, and more money is good and less money is bad, then I should cheat and park, uh, park illegally in the case we just described. So uh, let's call this a rationality principle. I should act always so that I maximize utility. That is, I'm always trying to achieve the most of the things I value. That's sort of intrinsic to the notion of being rational. Uh, and, in the, and in this case, we can understand the math this way. So uh, the way we'll represent this is we've got uh, EXP stands for the expected value. And in parentheses, we've got the action, parking illegally. And the, uh, the expected value of parking illegally in this case equals this uh, conjunction of terms. So first we've got the probability of getting a ticket times the utility of getting a ticket plus the probability of not getting a ticket times the utility of not getting a ticket. So it's 0 0.01 times minus 50 plus 0.99 times zero. Now, why is it 0 0.99 times zero? Well, 90 time, 99 times out of 100, nothing happens. My wallet stays the same. I don't get a ticket. I don't pay the meter. I just go in and get my coffee and come back out. And, and there's no net gain or no loss. So that's a status quo case. We just say 99% of the time, there's a zero status change. But 1% of the time, there's a minus $50 status change. Um, so when we add those together, we get this total of minus 50 cents per instance. Whereas the expected value of paying the meter is 100% certain it's going to cost me $1.50. So expected value of parking illegally is cheaper than the expected value of paying the meter. Okay, so the more abstract way to understand expected value theory is to put it this way. Um, the expected value of action A equals the probability of outcome 1 times the utility of outcome 1 plus the probability of outcome two times the utility of outcome two for however many outcomes and utilities we might have. And, and in most of the cases we're going to look at, we're just going to consider two mutually exclusive um, outcomes, either uh, B or not B, for instance. But in principle, for any action that can have an infinite number of um, outcomes, or in the case of this big formula that I've, I've copied down below, uh, for any action that can have um, a number of outcomes, uh, one through K, uh, what we do is we aggregate all of the probabilities and the utilities, and we multiply those two together, and then we add all those for however many uh, probabilities and utilities we have in mind. Okay, that sounds a little bit muddled, but uh, you'll see we'll start doing some single cases, and it'll be really uh, simple, really obvious that either one or the other thing will happen, and we can assign probabilities and utilities to both of them to figure out what's, what's next. Okay, so... Um, here's a slightly more formal way to put it. For two mutually exclusive outcomes, the expected value of action A equals the probability of B times the utility of B plus the probability of not B times the utility of not B. So um, what we'll call this thing, and I want to identify a couple of terms here, is that uh, the probability dis distribution is what a smart robot or a person will assign probabilities to the various possible outcomes of their actions. And the better your model of the world is, the more accurate these probabilities will be. In the example I just gave, we said uh, we expected that the uh, probability of ticket enforcement in that case on the uh, parking meter was 1%. So we said probability of getting caught is 1%, probability of not getting caught is 99%. Now, those are always estimations and those are always um, judgments that we're trying to make on the basis of experience and basis of information we've got. Um, and, and so the general notion here is that your probability distribution for an action is the range of probabilities that you attach to the various outcomes for that action. And then the second thing we're doing here is that we've got um, what computer scientists also call a value function. And that's the set of values that you assign to those various outcomes.
So we might attach a minus $50 value to a parking ticket. Um, you might attach a, a massive plus 500 value to a Taylor Swift concert, or you might attach a modest uh, plus six value to a cold beer, or stepping on a Lego in the dark is a minus 150. There's lots of ways we can do this, and I'll talk about different systems for attaching numbers. See, as soon as we've got numbers here that we can um, uh, correlate with the values these things have to us, then we can plug them into the equation, and we're up and running able to make uh, comparisons between different, different decisions. Uh, okay, so that's the value function. In this case, um, I've pointed out or I've identified the, uh, the values of the utilities with blue arrows to, um, to, to separate the two notions. Okay, so uh, our expected value theorem then says that the value of an action is the sum of the weighted averages of its different outcomes times their utilities. That's a way of putting in English what we just described uh, more mathematically. How much expected value does a choice have? Well, it depends on the probabilities for the outcomes and the utilities of the possible outcomes. So if I've got an action A and it'll have outcome B or not B, then we assign outcomes to those, um, to those outcomes, to B and not B. And then we, um, once we've got B and not B have values, positive or negative, um, I might value B very highly, it might make me happy, or I might put a high dis value on it, like getting hit by a meteor. So more formally, we'll put it this way, EX, the expected value theorem for two mutually exclusive outcomes is this, EXP of A equals probability of B times the utility of B plus the probability of not B times the utility of not B. And again, I'll show you a bunch of examples to make this clearer in just a second. So the future is uncertain, the outcomes of my actions are uncertain. Uh, if I park illegally, I predict the outcomes, I'll get a ticket or I won't. Um, I can make some estimates about the probability of different outcomes of an act. I mean, maybe in this particular case, you think the probability of getting a ticket is 25% and the probability of not getting a ticket is 75%. So let's change the example. Um, and then let's suppose that a ticket costs $52. So the utilities would be $52 minus $52 for the ticket and zero for no ticket because that's a case where you maintain the status quo. So plugged, uh, plugging all the values into the equation, then the expected value of parking illegally equals 25% of minus 52 plus 75% of zero, which equals minus $13. Okay, so what does that mean? That means, I mean, one way of thinking that is that you just made a decision and that were the situation to remain stable and were you to repeat that decision over and over and over again, and the probability distribution remained the same at 2575, then you would expect on average that each of those single decisions would cost you $13. Now, three times out of four, you'd get no ticket, but then on the fourth case, or roughly thereabouts, you'd get a $52 ticket, which means when we divide those in, you'd be $13 down for each particular decision. So it's like a weighted average. There's no single case where I'd actually pay $13, um, but I will pay $52 uh, 25% of the time when I act that way. Uh, An expected value lets me uh, get some numbers on this so I can start comparing. All right, so let's calculate some slightly harder examples. Um, take a roulette wheel. Uh, on a roulette wheel in a casino, there's 18 red slots and 18 black slots, and then there's two zero slots. And the way the house usually treats this is that you can bet on red or you can bet on black, but if the ball lands in the zeros, they get to take your money. So let's make a simple, ca a simple case where if you put a $1 bet down just on red, then that'll pay you $2. And if you, um, so there, if you bet on red, the probability of winning would be 18 out of 38. That is 18 reds out of 38 total uh, slots, which is 0.4737. So you've got a, a roughly 47% chance of winning if you bet on red. So if you don't, the probability of losing is 52% or 20 out of 38. Um, so you've got these two probabilities for winning or not winning now. So the expected value of winning, expected value of acting, that is putting your money, that your dollar down on red, equals a 47% chance times, now look what I've got here in the parentheses. I've got $2 minus $1. Why? Well, the $2 is the win that you get for uh, uh, picking the right color and the ball spinning the roulette, roulette wheel lands in the red, but the $1 is the dollar that you paid to play. 
So um, even though you gain $2, you're down by one to play the game. In both cases, you lose your dollar to play. If that's not the way a real roulette game works, that's okay. Uh, let's just stipulate in this case that it costs a dollar to play um, and your dollar goes away and then you get $2 back. So there's a net gain of only a dollar in that case. So when we do the math on this, you run 47% of a dollar and 52% of uh, minus a dollar, you get minus five cents. So what that says in effect is that playing roulette for a single instance and betting on red at these odds costs a nickel. Um, you're down by five cents. And were you to play over and over and over again hundreds or thousands of times, you'd expect that on average every one of those cases would come out to be about, uh, uh, you'd be down by five cents. So it's a losing proposition overall. Okay, so let's consider another more specific way to play roulette. Um, the other way you can play roulette is that you can put your dollar down on a particular number. Um, all those slots have numbers from 0 to 36, and the payout now for this game is 35 times the amount that you bet. So if you put down a dollar, you'll get a $35 win. So in this case, uh, you've got a 1 in 38 chance to win and 37 out of 38 chance to lose. The, so the expected value of playing a particular number equals... 0 0.0263 times 35 minus 1, minus 1 is the cost to, to play, um, plus 97, uh, 0.97 times minus $1. And then when we run the math on those and go ahead and consolidate them, we get minus 7 cents. So playing a single round of roulette at these odds with this kind of payout structure roughly costs 7 cents per round. Okay, so consider these two options. And um, partly you should pay attention to how I'm doing these because I'm giving you a bunch of reading, que reading quiz um, lecture questions, and they're all very similar to the ones I'm giving you now. They're easier than the homework assignment, um, but you'll need to be able to do them yourself for the uh, upcoming assignment. So consider these two gambles. Um, I'm going to play game one. I'm going to flip a coin, and if it's heads, I'll give you $5, and if it's tails, you give me $1. Okay, so that's a game that we might play. Here's another game. I'm going to flip a coin, and if it's heads, you give me $5, and if it's tails, I'll give you $15. So which one of those two gambles do you want to play? Uh, it's not immediately obvious just from looking at it which one's better, but expected value theorem lets us actually um, sort it out and figure out which one is better. So here is the expected value for game one. So in this particular game, I'm not charging you anything to play. So we flip a coin and 50% of the time you're going to get $5. And then 50% of the time you're going to pay me a dollar. So that nets you um, ahead by 250 and down by 50 cents, which is uh, expected value is a positive $2 for game one. Hopefully that math makes sense. And when we plug in the values for game two into um, the expected value formula, we get 50% of minus $5 is the way it's set up, or 50% of uh, $15, which comes out a net ahead of $5. So given the expected value numbers that are produced for game one and game two, game two is much better outcome. That were you to play um, game one over and over again, you'd get on average $2 per round. Whereas if you were to play game two over and over again, you'd get on average uh, $5 per round. So you get two and a half times more money by playing game two. If somebody ever offers you this, this choice, you're going to be ahead. You're going to be ahead either way, but you're going to be ahead much more if you play game two. If you could get those kind of odds in the stock market, you'd, uh, you'd be a billionaire. It wouldn't take you long to turn that into lots of money. Okay. So um, the numbers here then uh, run out this way. We just looked at those numbers. Now let me ask a question. Suppose you choose to play game two because you did the expected value calculation. You saw that this game pays out five versus two. Um, and then you play and you end up losing. It's one of the cases where you have to um, uh, pay me $5, for instance. So you, you chose the one with the higher expected value, and you played, and then you lose. So question, did you make the wrong decision? Because you just had to pay, whereas you might have won if you played the other game, right? So you chose a game with an uncertain outcome, you lost, and now the question is, did you make the wrong decision? We might be tempted 
to say that since you lost, you might say, oh, I should have played the other game, or I should have done something different, or I should have not played. But actually, you did make the right decision. Um, you did not make the wrong decision. And what happens here is something called outcome bias. People are highly prone to make this mistake of evaluating the quality of a decision on the basis of its outcome or on information that wasn't available when you made the decision. On the front side, looking at the expected value for game one and game two, game two is a better game to play. But going into game two, you know good and well that half of the time you're going to end up losing and you're going to end up paying $5. But what expected value says is half of the time you're also going to win and you're going to be ahead by $15. So on average, game two is going to pay off better. Now, maybe in the short term you didn't win or you didn't win, you know, you didn't come out ahead. But expected value tells you that were you to aggregate, zoom out, look at all your decisions and put them all together or to repeat this sort of action, if you were to always act this way, yes, you'll lose sometimes, but if you're making the right decision, we've got a sort of mathematical proof here that this one's going to give you more money overall. So outcome bias is the mistake of reevaluating or undermining a decision that was made that was made the right way, but then it happens to have some outcome you don't like, so we end up changing our mind about the decision. Very common for people to uh, evaluate the quality of the decision that went before on the basis of what happened after, so that's a mistake. It was the right decision to play game two, even if you lose. Okay, so this suggests some things about how we should view gambling in general. Um, people say things like, I'm feeling lucky, or I've got a system for beating the house, or I haven't won in a while, I'm due to hit, or maybe even worse, my horoscope said I'm going to have a big financial payout. Um, expected value theory isn't just about gambling, although we're going to use a lot of gambling examples, and it does inform us here. Um, you're not lucky, you don't have a system, and you're not due to hit. None of that's going to work. What's happening is that the casino is actually using expected value theory to beat you because they are playing the big odds, the long game, and um, they are calculating that hundreds or thousands of people are going to come into the casino today and they're going to make the wrong decision or they're going to make a decision on the basis of something else. And the casino can wait, the casino can can. Um, end up making a small amount on lots and lots of transactions because they're playing the larger aggregate numbers game and they're going to win in the big picture. So you could use expected value theory to minimize your losses, get your value, play smart, and act more rationally since that's the way they're using it. Okay, so here's another uh, example that might illustrate how expected value theory works. Um, suppose I find a mushroom in my garden and I look it up and there's some difficulty about identifying the thing. This actually happened to a friend of mine. Um, suppose we put the probability that this particular mushroom uh, is deadly at one in a thousand. Maybe there's a one in a thousand chance that this mushroom is actually a deadly mushroom, whereas there's a 999 um, out of a thousand chance that it's safe to eat. Um, and we're considering the option whether or not I should eat the thing. This friend of mine actually did this. Um, she, she really wanted to eat the mushroom and she got an expert to look at it and the expert said, well, that's probably a safe mushroom, but it might be this other deadly one. So I'd be careful. Um, so here's how the expected value decision for this, uh, the expected value theory for this decision goes. The expected value of eating this mushroom is a uh, one in a thousand. Uh, I've got one too many decimal places there. I've got one in 10,000. Uh, actually, it won't matter. Um, how much? So there's the probabilities of the two outcomes of you getting a poisonous mushroom or you not getting a poisonous mushroom, and now we got to think about the utility. So how much utility? How much disvalue or how much disutility do you attach to dying from eating a poisonous mushroom? I mean, I put that really, really bad. That's as bad as things can get. Versus how much positive value do you attach from a from a pleasant mushroom meal? Like you want to eat this mushroom and you really love mushrooms, so. Maybe you attach, I don't know, a plus 50 to that or whatever. Um, suppose, hypothetically, I put a minus 1 million uh, measurement or quantity on my dine and a plus 1 on my having a nice mushroom meal. I mean, that seems fair, right? Um, minus a million to die, plus 1 to get a mushroom meal. So if you run the math on this, of course, what comes out is that this is a really awful decision. Um, this The expected value result on this decision is minus... Um, 9,999. It's very negative. Um, and in effect, that what, what this person's done is this: the person who eats this mushroom is taking a, uh, 
a revolver with, uh, I've got my math wrong here, but they've taken a revolver with 10,000 uh, chambers in it. And they put one bullet into the chamber and spun it, and then they've uh, stuck it to their head and pulled the trigger. So how much do you want to play that game, that game of, of bizarre mushroom roulette? Um, would you do that for a million dollars? Would you do that for $10 million? I can't say that there's much upside. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't do it just to eat a mushroom. Um, and I'd be really hard pressed to do it for a million dollars. Um, if you were offering me a billion dollars, I might start thinking about it because those are pretty good odds. But um, a, a, a single mushroom dinner is certainly not worth a billion dollars, however good it is. Have to be a damn good mushroom. Uh, all right, so the, ab the admonition here is that is from the utilitarians, from John Stuart Mill, from Jeremy Bentham, is that act always so that you maximize expected utility. Uh, you have goals, and we want to act in ways that will achieve your goals. So you want to act in the ways that achieve them the most efficiently and most effectively. Um, that is maximize utility, whatever sorts of things you might attach utility to or whatever sorts of goal you goals you have, you want to get more of it. Some goals, some desires, some lives might be more valuable than others. Um, and philosophers for eons have been sort of debating that question. You know, that Aristotle argued that having a, a fulfilling life that where you achieve all of your human, human purposes and you acquire eudaimonia is the most desirable life and um, a virtuous life is the most desirable life. And, you know, Kant and Mill and, and lots of other moral theorists have had debates over what, what sort of life is the most valuable life. Um, strictly speaking, utility theory doesn't address that directly. All it does is says, given that you've got goals, this is the best way to achieve them. This lets you quantify and put some numbers on how to get to your goals, whatever they might be. This will work as well for a, a serial killer as it will for uh, the Dalai Lama. Uh, whatever it is thereafter, uh, this will provide the uh, most instrumentally rational ways to achieve their goals. Uh, and I'll direct you to our, some of our other courses in the curriculum for figuring out which, are the better, which goals are better to have. Um, but we can an analyze whether, given that you're a goal-seeking agent, you are actually behaving in ways that will attain those goals. And that was my point about the mushroom dinner. Um, that unexpected value theory is an irrational choice to choose eating that mushroom over the possible death, even the remote possible death. So uh, my question there was, was the mushroom decision irrational? I think it was, at least the way I set it up. Uh, what about skydiving or rock climbing or playing chicken in a car on a curvy road after drinking with your friends with the lights off? Um, some of those might be irrational too, depending on what you're doing or how risky they are. Um, so we won't tackle too much of that, but we'll just try to attach some numbers to these and do some examples. All right, give me, let me give you another case to plug in some values into the theorem. So imagine you're a security guard at a pot dispensary and the cash register up front has $3,200 in it and the shelves in the back of the building have $7,100 worth of pot sitting on them. You can't watch both of them. You can be in one or the other, but not in both places. If you're present, a thief will be deterred. So you think about you think the probability that a thief will go after the cash register is about 0.6, and you think the probability that a thief will go after the pot in back is 0.4. Which should you watch? What should you do given those utility distributions and those probability distributions? So the way to set this up is to think, well, if I what's the expected value of my guarding the cash register? Well, if I guard the cash register, I've decided that there's a 60% chance that the thieves will come after the cash register. And if they do, I'll be there guarding it. So they'll be deterred and there'll be no loss. They will have, let's assume the thieves are going to try one, but not both things. So if I guard the cash register and they go after the cash register, then there's a zero utility um, gain or loss. So 60% times zero, plus there's a 40% chance and this is in the case where I'm guarding the cash register, there's still a 40% chance that they'll go after the pot shelves in the back of the building. So a 40% chance that, I, the, that my company or that the business will be out by $7,100. So running the math on that one, or sorry, I'll run the math in just a second. Uh, in contrast, what's the expected value of guarding the shelves in back? Well, this case is just the reverse. So now there's a 40% chance that they're going to come after uh, the shelves in back, in which case I'm waiting for them. I'm the, the, the security guard, so they'll be deterred. 
and there's a 60% chance they'll go after the cash register in front, I'm not up front, so then they'll get that money, they'll get that $3,200. So if you run the math on these two numbers, we're going to get um, the expected value for the cash register is minus 2840. The expected value for guarding the shelves is minus 1920. So that means that the better thing to do here is the thing that loses less, the thing that comes to a, a, a smaller net loss. So I should guard the shelves. If I guard the shelves, um, we'll only be out by 1920. If I guard the cash register, we'll be out by 2840. So the better decision is to guard the shelves. Um, okay, so a background issue, a conceptual issue that comes up in these contexts a lot is this question about whether utility theory is descriptive or prescriptive. And I'm just gonna say a word about this before we move on. Um, one kind of economist characterizes expected utility theory as a descriptive theory. And what that means is that they and philosophers alike are saying that, that this theorem or this uh, formula that we've just been looking at um, describes how people actually do maximize their utilities and that we can infer the utilities that decisions will, that people will make by look, by applying this theory. So it says this describes what humans actually do. And there's actually a lot of examples that seem to support this interpretation. There's a lot of cases where people act in ways that can be described very well by expected value theory. Other people characterize expected utility theory as a normative theory. They say that even though we don't always act this way, we should. Um, and many of the things I've said here so far have suggested that, that um, if you're tempted to not follow expected value theory, you actually should because you'll get better results if you do. Um, and there's still others that are, reject both, uh, both interpretations, but those are very abstract and very complicated debates that are in the literature, and we don't have to worry about that part. Um, and I'll just raise one little question here to get you to think about whether or not it's right to do it. Um, imagine this kind of case. Imagine that you're poor and you get chosen to make a half court shot at an NBA game during halftime, um, let's say for a million dollars. And you make your, you take your shot and you make it. All right. So now you've got a million dollars that they're going to let you walk out of the building with because you made this shot. Uh, so Shaquille O'Neal walks up and he offers to flip a coin. And if it's heads, he will triple your winnings. Or if it's tails, then you got to give up your million dollars. So what should you do in this case? Um, so the expected value for this choice, the expected value for flipping the coin is a 50% chance that you get $3 million and a 50% chance you'll get nothing. Um, Whereas, uh, so when you run the math on that, the expected value of taking this bet is $1.5 million. You've got a 50% chance at $3 million. So on the surface, that looks pretty positive because the other option of not taking the coin toss is a case where you get to have a million dollars, you get to take it home. Um, and so expected value theory, it would seem, would tell us to take the bet and go ahead and take the coin toss because it, it has a higher expected value. Um, is there an argument for not taking the bet contrary to the expected value principle? I think this case you might look at it and go, uh, you know, I don't think I'm going to take the bet. And I think you might defend it as being reasonable. I mean, consider that if you're poor, you just made a million dollars and you're s facing a pretty significant chance of walking out of the building with nothing. And this is a very rare opportunity. They're never going to get another chance like this. You're not going to get a chance to do this over and over and over again, where you get to make this money on it and get these averages. Uh, and a million dollars would make a huge change in your life. It seems like you might reasonably go because this is a, a rare case or because this is a unique opportunity. You might say, no, I don't want to take the bet. And you might take your million, million dollars and leave, even though expect value theory says that there's a, that the better choice would be to take the bet. Um, I'll let you sort of puzzle over that. That's one of the kinds of cases in the literature that people worry about. And when we do more advanced study on this question, um, we're just going to look at some real cases where we actually apply it. Okay. So a quick side note, I want to just mention um, a, 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 an argument from a guy named Steve Omohundru about super intelligent artificial intelligences. Um, and what does that mean? Well, uh, some people in Silicon Valley are worried about uh, super intelligent AI. And uh, Omohundru argues that in order to achieve its goals, an agent must act according to the expected value theorem. I mean, I've been saying that, and our, our prescriptive uh, interpretation of expected value theory says, look, this is the way to, to, to better achieve what you're after. So 
Um, acting according to expected value also requires that you correctly assign probabilities to events and correctly assign utilities to their outcomes. So improving an agent's ability to correctly assign probabilities and utilities will improve its capacity to achieve goals and therefore be rational. So Alma Hunter's idea here is, imagine you've got an AI that gets smart enough to start realizing that, well, if I could identify probabilities better, and if I could identify utilities better, then I could better achieve my goals, whatever those might be. So Alma Hunter's idea then is, that what will happen is that it's required by reason insofar as it's possible for an agent to become more intelligent, better able to estimate probabilities of events and their utilities. So what's going to happen over time is that a sufficiently advanced general AI will be highly motivated to change its own software and hardware that help it maximize its utility functions. So a super intelligent AI is going to see the point here and it's going to try to make itself smarter. Modifications that will make it more rational and improve its ability to estimate utility functions will help make it will help it maximize its utility functions. It will be able, whatever it wants to achieve, it'll be able to do it better if it can do a better job at probabilities and utilities. So modifications that make it smarter, that protect it from alteration from the outside, that secure resources for its pursuit of its goals will maximize its utility function, which is supposed to make us um, uh, somewhat worried here because a sufficiently advanced general AI will act in self-improving ways that lead to an intelligence explosion. Uh, so the idea is that um, once they're smart enough, they're going to try to make themselves smarter, and then they're going to try to uh, acquire resources and um, achieve better and better models of the world so that they can um, achieve whatever goals they happen to have. Okay, I'll leave that argument aside. We pursue that in some of my other courses. Um, let me just say a word about this, what we've been doing here. We've been measuring utilities. So far, we've been using dollars as a convenient way to think about value, but that's not always right. Um, and in utility theory, we actually have two different ways of measuring value. We can use an ordinal scale or a cardinal scale. An ordinal scale, it's very easy. It just indicates the order of preferences, but it doesn't give any indication of how much more someone prefers or the distance between the options. So suppose um, you give me these options. I consider an ice cream sundae to be the best. Um, smashing my thumb with a hammer is worse, and even worse still is spending 90 days in isolation for the coronavirus. So an ordinal ranking of those three things, we'll just put them as one, two, three, but it doesn't have any distance between them. It doesn't say how much, you know, um, you might think that, uh, that a, uh, an ice cream bar is, it fits in between one and two, but an ice cream bar would be really close to an ice cream sundae, but, but smashing your thumb with a hammer, that's a great deal of distance away. An ordinal scale doesn't capture any of that. An ordinal, ordinal scale just tells us the order and nothing more. And the thing is the way, depending on how we rank our choices and which kind of scale we use, we'll get different outcomes in uh, these calculations. Not a, not a problem we're going to have to deal with in here, but I just wanted to communicate that there's these different kinds of scales. Okay, so an ordinal scale doesn't rank the distance or the qualities of the differences between the things, whereas a cardinal scale does allow us to measure some of the distance and comparable units between objects. So money um, gives us a cardinal scale way to compare things. Or Jeremy Bentham is famous for proposing these things he called hedons. Um, suppose I work... Uh, part -time, a part-time job for 10 hours and I get $15 an hour, then I spend part of that on sushi that I love. So in that kind of case, you get this translation <clears throat> where five and a half hours of my work equals the amount of pleasure that I get from a plate of sushi, if I, if I consider that to be a fair trade. Um, or we might use hedons, which is just an arbitrary unit um, and we can scale it as big or as small as you want, but let's just call it an, uh, a unit and we'll attach some, uh, a number of them to the various things that I like. So for example, here's four things that I've rated. Um, I've ranked them ordinally. So I might put um, on an ordinal scale with the number, the higher number, meaning it's a thing that I value more. I might value a week vacation with Brad Pitt to be the best. And I might value a Gunther's 50-50 uh, um, with strawberry ice and vanilla ice cream. Um, I might value that next best. That's like a, 
That's a, if you haven't had it, it's like an ice cream treat you can get from an ice cream place here in Sacramento. Um, whereas I might consider the orange one to be a close third choice to that. Um, and, and then of these four things, I value death by far the very lowest choice. So an ordinal scale just doesn't capture any of the details about the nuances between these four things. But a cardinal scale might let me do that. It might let me attach, for instance, it might put 1,500 hedon units onto the vacation with Brad Pitt. And then it might put, you know, uh, 20 units on the uh, ice cream sundae and 18 units on the ice cream sundae that I like slightly less and minus um, a million units on death, for instance. And we can, you know, argue about, well, um, so is the uh, week vacation with Brad Pitt, is that worth, you know, a um, uh, uh, hundred times more or a thousand times more? Um, valuable to you than a strawberry uh, ice cream. Um, you, you might think so. I don't know. Or, or consider this option. You can go to In-N-Out Burger and you can get a burger and fries for six, six bucks, eight bucks. Or you can go to a fancy Italian restaurant downtown and you can get a meal for $120. So is that fancy meal you went and got downtown, is that worth, uh, um, what did I say, $80, 10 So is that worth 14 times as much as the In-N-Out burger and fries? And it might be worth it to you. It might not, um, depending. And a cardinal scale will let you assign some value so that you can get those um get your preferences, your various preferences accurately ranked and accurately described so that they're, they're in ratio or they have the right kinds of intervals between them. Um, and money usually lets us do that, uh, or at least for our purposes, that'll be the simple way to do it. So we've got ordinal scales and cardinal scales to think about in this discussion. Okay, so just a quick summary of everything so far then. Um, we've considered the expected value theorem for two mutually exclusive outcomes, and that looks like that formula. The bigger formula that includes all the possible outcomes and all the possible utility, utilities is this other uh, thing that I've um, uh, got the picture of. I'm going to hold you responsible for the first one, not for the second in this course. And then we've talked about probability distributions, which is the assignment of probabilities to the various outcomes that you would make when you make a decision. The value functions, the set of values that you that the agent assigns to those various outcomes with a metric, either using a, cord, a cardinal scale or an ordinal scale. And then um, finally, we've looked at a bunch of examples where you've considered an actual applied case, like the expected value of parking illegally. Um, and that would be the probability of a ticket times the utility of the ticket plus the probability of no ticket times the utility of uh, parking illegally when getting away with it. Okay, so that's my first uh, expected value theory lecture. We're going to do a bunch more examples and cases and look at some more complicated um, instances in my next lecture.